month has been devastating. The news from Gaza has us all heartbroken. Countless people tell me they're feeling helpless. Some people tell me they just break down crying in random places, at work, sitting at their desk, or if they're part of a team, in front of their coworkers, they just have to excuse themselves because they just can't handle the emotional rush of remembering some of these terrible images. I've seen personally people at dinner, we're all sitting, we're all eating, people are talking, one person's just staring blankly and they just start to tear up and start crying. If you haven't cried over the atrocities in Palestine, then I can't imagine what kind of mind-numbing, iman-killing content you've been consuming that has deadened your heart. Whatever it is, you need to stop. Either that, or perhaps you need to open up your chest and check if you even have a heart, because maybe you've lost your, in, your, your heart, your, your humanity entirely. Many people are asking the question, if millions of people are making dua, praying for Gaza, why aren't our du'as answered? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala informs us throughout the Qur'an of numerous conditions of victory, some internal and some external. Let's take a look at some of the internal conditions. Number one, you have to be people of true faith. Allah Ta'ala says, بَعْدَ أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ إِنَّا لَنَنْصُرُ رُسُلَنَا وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا وَيَوْمَ يَقُومُ الْأَشْهَادِ Indeed, we will support our messengers and those who believe in this dunya, in this worldly life, and on the day when the witnesses will stand. So the question you have to ask yourself, point number one, can you really say that you're a person of faith or are you just nominally Muslim? Are you the type of person that has actually taken the time to learn their deen and have firm knowledge? Do you treat it like a serious subject? Or do you still have the same questions that you had for the past 5 to 10 to 15 to 20 years? It's, it's always heartbreaking to me. Oh yeah, I've always wondered that. I had this question for the past 10 years, I still haven't gotten the answer. SubhanAllah, if you had questions about your deen, confusion, doubts, issues lingering in your mind that have lasted that long, that means you are not taking your deen seriously because you're not actually doing any research. Point number two, people of patience. Allah Ta'ala gives victory to the patient. Allah says, كَم مِن فِئَةٍ قَلِيلَةٍ غَلَبَتْ فِئَةً كَثِيرَةً بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ وَاللَّهُ مَعَ الصَّابِرِينَ How many times, how many a small company, a small group has overcome the large company by the permission of Allah and Allah is with the patient. Allah is with the patient. In other words, yes, the smaller group can overcome the bigger one, but they have to be in it for the long haul. They have to be patient. They have to wear them down slowly. It's going to take a while. Allah Ta'ala also says, فَإِنْ مِنْكُمْ مِئَةٌ صَابِرَةٌ يَغْلِبُ مِئَتَيْنِ وَإِنْ يَكُمْ مِنْكُمْ أَلْفٌ يَغْلِبُ أَلْفَيْنِ بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ وَاللَّهُ مَعَ الصَّابِرِينَ so if there are from you 100 who are patient and steadfast, as long as you have that patience and that steadfast, persevering attitude, then they will overcome 200, double. And if there are among you 1,000, then they will overcome 2,000 by the permission of Allah. And Allah is with those who are patient and steadfast and persistent. So point number one, you have to have, we have to be people of true faith. Point number two, people of patience. And point number three, Allah Ta'ala says that we have to be people of ihsan. This is a condition. And what does that mean? Well, first Allah Ta'ala says, فَآتَاهُمُ اللَّهُ ثَوَابَ الدُّنْيَا وَحُسْنَ ثَوَابِ الْآخِرَةِ وَاللَّهُ يُحِبُّ الْمُحْسِنِينَ So Allah gave them the reward of this world, speaking about the victory of this world, and the good reward of the hereafter, and Allah loves those who are people of Ihsan. You might say to yourself, Ihsan means excellence. Does that mean I have to be a perfect Muslim? How can I be perfect? I'm not an angel, I make lots of mistakes. Well, subhanAllah, take a look at the ayah right before it. Allah Ta'ala mentions the dua of the people who were facing their enemy and they made this dua. رَبَّنَا اغْفِرْ لَنَا ذُنُوبَنَا وَإِسْرَافَنَا فِي أَمْرِنَا وَثَبِّتْ أَقْدَامَنَا وَانْصُرْنَا عَلَى الْقَوْمِ الْكَافِرِينَ They were making the dua, our Lord, forgive us of our sins. So clearly they weren't perfect. They were sinful people, they made mistakes. But they're making dua. And they're asking Allah to forgive them. And they're saying, Oh Allah, forgive us of our sins and the excess and the waste in our affairs and plant firmly our feet and give us victory over the disbelieving people. So this is their manifestation of Ihsan. These are people of faith, number one, people of sabr, number two, and people of what? Ihsan, meaning what? Meaning not that you're perfect, 
but that you recognize your mistakes, you recognize your weaknesses, you turn back to Allah Ta'ala in repentance, and you are always trying to improve. Is that the quality that we have? Are we people of firm faith and knowledge? Are we people who persevere in all kinds of circumstances? And are we the types that are always working on improvement? These are the internal conditions that are required for victory. What about the external conditions? Preparation. Point number one is preparation. Externally, you have to be people who use the means available to you. As Allah Ta'ala says, وَأَعِدُّوا لَهُمْ مَا اسْتَطَعْتُمْ مِنْ قُوَّةٍ Allah Ta'ala commands and prepare against them whatever you are able to of power. You have to be ready. You have to prepare. You can't just sit around and say, oh, it's never going to be us. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm fine. Oh, a terrible thing's happening out there, but us, we're going to be in comfort forever. No, you have to be ready. And point number two and three come in the same ayat. Point number two and three are what? You have to be able to obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even in the worst of circumstances, even in the heat of the battle. That's point number two. And point number three is what? You have to avoid division. These two come in the following ayat. Allah ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhaladina amanu, idha laqitum fi'atan fathbutu, wadhkuru Allah kathiran la'allakum tuflihun, wa ati'u Allah wa rasulahu, wa la tanaza'u, fatafshalu wa tadhaba rihukum. Allah ta'ala says, O you who have believed, when you encounter a company from the enemy forces, stand firm and remember Allah much that you may be successful and obey Allah and his messenger and do not dispute and thus lose courage and then your strength would depart. So in terms of the external, we have to number one, be prepared. Number two, obey Allah's commands, specifically the commands that are relevant to the circumstances of war. You have to apply your deen when it's hardest to. When you're in the heat of battle and emotions are flying, you have to still remain calm. And number three is you have to avoid division. As Allah says, وَلَا تَنَازَعُوا Allah commands us, do not dispute with one another. وَتَذْهَبَ رِيحُكُمْ Why? Because that would cause you to lose your strength and your courage would depart from you. But many of us may ask the question, okay, I understand that these are the conditions, but what about us in the West? What about us here? Well, if we want our du'as answered, I want to remind you of one single hadith. One simple hadith in terms of a necessary pre prerequisite so that your du'a is answered. And this applies to us the most. The Prophet tells us what? وَالَّذِي نَفْسِ بِيَدِهِ لَتَأْمُرُنَّ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَلَتَنْهَوُنَّ عَنِ الْمُنْكَرِ أَوْ لَيُوشِكَنَّ اللَّهُ أَنْ يَبْعَثَ عَلَيْكُمْ عِقَابًا مِنْهُ ثُمَّ تَدْعُونَهُ فَلَا يُسْتَجَابُ لَكُمْ I swear by the one in whose hands my soul is. Either you are going to command what is good and forbid what is evil. You are going to give da'wah and call to the truth. Or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will soon send upon you a punishment from him. Then you will call upon him and he will not respond to you. Either you are giving da'wah, either you are the type of people who call to the truth of Islam, and if not, then you can expect that your du'as will not be responded to. Brothers and sisters, I want us to think about this not only in terms of the spiritual realm, in terms of the unseen and Allah's divine wisdom. I want you to think about it even practically. Why aren't non-Muslims objecting to all of the financial and military aid sent to Israel. Why aren't they objecting? Why aren't they mad about it? Don't you ever wonder? Billions of dollars. And it seems like some of them are upset, but a lot of them are just kind of going along, not really bothered by it. Why is that the case? Well, let me explain to you why. Because they're involved in their own da'wah campaign. Because the media paints Muslims as villains. That's their da'wah. We all know it. I don't need to explain that. Take a look at the media and you find that their da'wah campaign is paint these people as Muslims. Therefore, if our money is going over there and it's going to be bombing them and their children and their family and so forth, well, it's not nice, but no big deal. That's their da'wah. What's our da'wah? Our job is to represent ourselves and to represent our faith accurately by calling people to the truth of Islam. So there are two jobs going on, two forms of da'wah going on. And the sad reality is they outwork us. So when they outwork us, when they are hustling constantly, when you see how much money is put online and to every news station, media, uh, spreading these lies, perpetuating all sorts of nonsense, what do you find? You find that they don't stop. Meanwhile, most of us don't even start. I'll say that again. 
They don't stop, but it seems most of us don't even start when it comes to da'wah. So is it any wonder that you're raising your hands, Ya Allah, make this aid and all these weapons and all this money, make it stop. You should have been on the job earlier. You should have recognized that their da'wah campaign was going on and our da'wah campaign should have been outworking them because the truth should always outwork falsehood. The believer should always outwork those who are motivated by evil. Those who are motivated by Allah and the Akhirah should always outwork those who are motivated by dunya and by the waswas shaitan by the evil suggestions of Satan. And by the way, this doesn't just apply to us. I don't understand the situation going on overseas very much. I can't say I'm an expert on the situation. But when I ask people from overseas, how is it the case? How is it possible that there are these Muslim countries and there are these Muslim soldiers that work for these governments and they seem to be more willing to kill their own brothers and sisters than they are to fight the oppressor? How is this the case? The consistent answer I get across, doesn't matter which country I'm talking to, which, which person I'm talking to from which country, consistent answer I get is what? Well, the governments, they go into the uneducated, impoverished villages, and they basically turn those people into soldiers. And these people that they go find, these people, they don't have any sort of deen because they don't have any sort of education, so they'll just do whatever they're told, right? I've heard this many times, I'm sure we've all heard this. Oh, they go and get the riffraff of society. So what is the conclusion? The conclusion is there was a race. The problem is that we weren't racing. There was a race to see who would influence them first. There was a race. Will it be the religious who go to these villages, to these remote areas of their own country, give them da'wah, educate them, teach them about their deen, teach them about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and how to be a good person? Or were the Muslims sitting back, relaxing, not realizing that there was a race, and so therefore, some government decided, hey, this looks like perfect uh, green fertile fields. I can come and grab these guys and recruit them, take them, influence them, brainwash them, tell them whatever, offer them a little bit of bread, offer them a little bit of food, offer them a little bit of money, and they'll do whatever I tell them. If the believers were serious about their da'wah, we'd have prevented the problem before it even started. So let me remind you of the hadith that applies perfectly well to here and overseas. I hope you hear this now with fresh ears and thinking about it from a new perspective. I swear by the one in whose hands my soul is, either you command to good and forbid what is evil, get serious about da'wah, or Allah will soon send upon you a punishment and you will call upon him and you will not be responded to. I hope we take this more seriously. Recognize that da'wah is happening, either for or against us. Get involved. Take it seriously. If we're not giving da'wah, if we are not doing our job to promote the message of Islam, then it's like we're playing with fire in our own house. And then the moment that our home starts to burn, we don't grab any water. We don't get our family out of the house. We just sit there and say, Ya Allah, why is this happening to me? Why is this happening to me? Am I suggesting that we stop making du'a? No. I am saying make du'a. Absolutely. But make dua and say what? Ya Allah, I know that I don't deserve to be answered, but I promise to turn back to you. I promise to repent from all of these preve preventers, these things that are preventing, al mawani, that are preventing a response. And I promise to use my voice for the sake of Islam. Make this promise that you're going to use your voice to speak and to give da'wah and to call to the truth to whoever you can. In whatever circle of influence you have, use your voice for the sake of da'wah. Why? Because if you use your voice for the sake of da'wah, then inshallah ta'ala, it will strengthen your voice when you're making du'a. Inshallah, we'll continue in the second khutbah. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Muhammad wa ala alayhi wa sallam, 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 Bismillah, bismillah, walhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam, ala rasulillah. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah that this event, despite the fact that it is horrendous and heartbreaking, Alhamdulillah, we have been seeing over this past month some reason to have hope. Many have realized that there needs to be a change. I have had in this community, alhamdulillah, volunteers coming to me, becoming more serious and consistent with our convert dinners. Alhamdulillah, it's such a blessing to see that we're finding different brothers and sisters getting very serious about ensuring 
that our new brothers and sisters feel that they're part of our family. For too long do people take shahada, embrace Islam, they disappear, we never see them again. Alhamdulillah, now we're seeing a new effort of people on a regular basis, roughly once a month, saying, no, let's get together, let's hang out, let's feed them, let's talk. Let's, it's, it makes such a powerful difference. I've had volunteers who come to me and said, I want to set up interfaith meetings. We need to get out of our shell. We need to expose ourselves to the world. So I give them, let's say, the phone number of a particular pastor. And they said, okay, I'll call him, I'll set it up. They're going to come to the masjid, I'll get the food, I'll get it ready. I want people to know about who we are. I want them to see the salah and know about tawheed. I need to talk to them about the truth of Islam. Alhamdulillah, we're seeing volunteers pop up for that as well. I've seen that our sisters are organizing events that are larger and more frequent than ever before. MashaAllah. I've had several brothers tell me that they're finally serious about traveling abroad to study Islam. Alhamdulillah. For so long, I've been looking and searching and talking to different people, and it was really heartbreaking to me when I visited Minnesota. And I was asking them, do you guys have young people that go study abroad? They're like, yeah, of course, like 10 guys a year. I was like, what, you serious? He's like, yeah, it's very normal for us. You know, one brother will just say, hey guys, I'm gonna be gone for the next year. They get on a plane, they go, they study Arabic, and they you know, learn fiqh and aqidah, and they study their deen, they go to this country, that country, and they come back. I'm like, you said 10 a year? He's like, yeah, it's standard. What, what about you guys? I was a little bit embarrassed, but alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, nowadays we're finally seeing that hopefully this will become a community where we can be proud and say alhamdulillah, regularly we send people, study their deen, come back and benefit the community. And if they can't afford it, alhamdulillah, Allah gave us the means, we can sponsor them. This is a need in our community. We absolutely need it to create that type of knowledge and leaders amongst us. Alhamdulillah, so I'm seeing it's growing. People are watching what's happening overseas and they're getting serious about their deen. And of course, alhamdulillah, those who are paying attention online, I'm sure you've seen it. There are countless videos of people online who are giving their testimony and they're saying how this crisis has opened their eyes to the corruption of politicians, corruption of the media, and how they've seen the beauty of Islam and the incredible faith of the believers during times of crisis who they only turn to Allah and they never complain and they're always grateful. And this has completely revolutionized their mind. They couldn't believe that such humans exist and it caused them to do what? It caused them to finally read the Qur'an and many of them embrace Islam, alhamdulillah. And what I'm trying to say, simply put, is what? Many people, both Muslim and non-Muslim, are taking stock of themselves and making improvements because of the events that have been taking place over this past month. So if these events aren't a wake-up call for you and I, then what? If you're not going to see a change, then what? Remember the words of the Prophet Al-Mu'minul Qawi, khayrun wa ahabu ila Allah min al-mu'minul da'if wa fi kullin khayr, that a strong believer is better and more loved, more beloved to Allah than the weak believer. And in both of them there is good. We don't want to be just getting by Muslim. We don't want to be the weak believer. We want to be strong. We want to be strong in terms of our faith. We want to be strong academically. We want to be strong financially. We want to be strong in terms of our deen. We want to be strong in terms of our bodies. We need to have strength. This is what the ummah lacks. If you can't see it, you're blind. Open your eyes. We need strength. It's so obvious. And then the Prophet says what? احرص على ما ينفعك واستعن بالله ولا تعجز Be eager for that which benefits you. Work. For the akhirah, be eager for it. And what? And seek help from Allah and don't lose heart. Never lose heart. As long as Allah Ta'ala is in charge. And Allah Ta'ala is always in charge. So Alhamdulillah, we should remember this and we should never forget, final point inshallah Ta'ala, is the statement of Musa alayhi salam. When he was speaking to Bani Israel, they were complaining. And what does Musa alayhi salam tell them? Asa rabbukum an yuhlika aduwakum. Very powerful words from Musa salam that are so relevant today. He said, perhaps your Lord will destroy your enemy. Did that happen? Yes, Allah Ta'ala did destroy Fir'aun. Uh, they're complaining, they're complaining. He says, look, it could be the case that Allah will destroy your enemy, which did happen. And then he says, what? And he may give you succession in the land and in the earth. He'll give you, put you on top, make you strong and powerful. Did that happen? Absolutely it happened. We're seeing it today. They're in charge, they have strength. But what did Musa alayhi salam warn them? He then said, فَيَنظُرَ كَيْفَ تَعْمَلُونَ And then Allah is going to see how you act. How are you going to act? And we see how they act. This was the warning 
of Musa alayhi to the Israelites. And now we see that they have been given power in the land and they're doing the same crimes that were done to them. And so the reason why this is remarkable is because number one, they're doing the same crimes. You would think that they would have learned. But number two, I think more important for us to realize is that this is a warning to us. We want to have strength. We're making dua for izzah. We're making dua for honor and leadership. Well, perhaps Allah Ta'ala will give it to us. But are we spiritually ready for the temptations that come along with it? All that money, all that power, etc. So we make dua. Ya Allah, help us fulfill the conditions of victory by number one, having true faith based on firm knowledge. Number two, having patience with your decree, Ya Allah, and your wisdom. Number three, having excellence through repenting and consistently trying to improve. Number four, by, prepare, by preparing through whatever means we have. Number five, by obeying your commands, Ya Allah, even in the toughest of circumstances. And number six, avoiding division that weakens us. Number seven, Ya Allah, make us people of da'wah who outwork the lies of the propaganda machine. Ya Allah, make us people of da'wah who outwork, outwork the lies of the propaganda machine. And finally, Ya Allah, when you give victory to this ummah, Ya Rabb, don't let us become just as bad as today's oppressors or even worse. Allahumma hadina fi man hadayt, wa aafina fi man aafayt, wa tawallana fi man tawallayt, wa barak lana fi ma aatayt, wa qina sharra ma qadayt, fa innaka taqdi wa la yuqda alayk, innahu la yadhillu man walayt, wa la ya'izzu man aadayt, tabarakta rabbana wa ta'alayt, rabbana atina fi dunya hasana, wa fil akhirati hasana wa qina adha bin nar, wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Muhammad, wa ala alayhi wa sahbihi wa sallam simi kthira wa aqmi salah. Please, if you could stand up and move forward, we need space.